hopefully show up. <laughs> yeah, I see people coming in. Oh, good. It's not just the three of us? It, no. Oh, good. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, we'll give everyone like, I don't know, what's passing time? We'll give people like a minute for this thing to load. And then we'll used get going. to be seven minutes past the hour, Sam. You know, I know. And I, t I made that joke actually with someone at Harvard about it being seven minutes passing time. And I said, no, 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 you're out of date. You're old. It's now zero because the campus has gotten so big that it's like impossible to get across it in seven minutes. So they just reset it to everything starting on the hour. There's no more passing time. That's how Wait, old we are. How do you do they end 10 minutes early then? No, I just think like, I just think it's potentially impossible to like stack classes like hour to hour because there's too much space between like Alston and wherever else. You know, so they said, and again, what I was told is that they just have abolished passing time, which I really like that seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, I have a, I also learned that there are lots of classes that are just fully online, even though you're on campus. In our era, and we'll give people one more minute to start, I guess we'll make it three minutes of passing time. But I actually remember in our era, um, it, they were just starting to be classes that you could get on your laptop, right? Like some classes were recorded and you can go through some folder structure and find some classes. And it was like a really amazing big deal that you could sit in your in your dorm room and actually get any content whatsoever. Um, but I don't remember how times that. it I, it wasn't a lot, but it was possible. It was just like, it was such a cool idea that something would be online. Yeah, the internet. <laughs> anyway. Well, it anyway, looks like the number is stabilized, start. Sam. So maybe we oh, can good. get through. So let's start. Yeah. So Mark and Silla, again, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it uh, at the end of the week to, to be here and, and you know talk with me and everyone about Harvard and this overseers campaign. Uh, we're so excited to be here. So um, I think that like just very tactically, I think it's important to remind people that this is the not the process to get you even on the ballot. So this is yes, not correct. to even like vote for you. I think people have plenty of time to learn more about you and decide who they want to vote for on the board of overseers. This is literally just to get you on the ballot, which um, I applaud you for all of your efforts and your dedication and love for Harvard and your willingness to do what has been, you know, several months of work um, to get on the ballot to sort of make your case of why um, you'd love to do this. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. It has been, I will tell you, as with most good things in life, you decide to do them and you know they're going to be a lot of work and then you start doing them and they're 10 times more work than you expected. <laughs> so I think this so, goes, so that's, goes in the camera. But that's our, that's our goal for today is we want to convince as many of the people who are joining that it's worth it to go set up a Harvard key account so we can get <laughs> through this, this uh, somewhat difficult process of nominating Sam. Um, you know, we're, we're more confident than in a vote situation that he'll, he'll do well, but getting over that first hurdle is a big deal. So yes. we, I, I really appreciate everyone taking the time on a Friday afternoon, um, evening on the East coast to, to tune in. And Sam, I know, where, where do you want to start? Can we, should we, should well, we just, um, just jump in and embarrass say, you and say some, say some things? Well, I want to say I've done my part. I voted for Sam. And I guess this is your way of supporting Sam, Mark, because I want to remind everyone that Mark cannot vote in this election <laughs> or in this sign-in process. My, my honorary doctor of letters is meaningless in this context. I can't believe that they don't let doctor, you have a, a doctorate from Harvard, you can't vote. It's wild. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's anyway. a knockoff. It's a knockoff. Anyway, you know, I, I think we we are all here today, or at least the the vast majority of people joining, because um because I think we care about Harvard, right, and uh, believe it's an important institution in the world, and and believe that when Harvard succeeds, then that not only creates volumes of um of great research that advance the world, but but also is is just important for training generations and in terms of the values and skills that they need to to be able to then go on to to shape the world positively and um and this is something that that Priscilla and I obviously care about a lot and I, I think a lot of the people who are on the call do and um I, I know we all engage in the university in different ways I and mean, Priscilla and I have started you know, worked with the university to start programs um and most recently this um, AI center the Kempner Center to uh, hopefully help advance the university in another area that's going to be important for the future. But the other um, reason why um, why why we're we're here is 
uh, because we believe that Sam would be really uh, helpful in, in shaping the the institution going forward. I mean, we we have you know both had the honor of uh, of getting to know and and knowing Sam for a long time. I, I met him in in college and just got to know him a lot better over time, um, including a, a stint of of several years of him working as a a product leader at um at what was then Facebook, now Meta. Um, and, and, you know, I just think that Sam is the kind of person who you want helping to oversee an important institution like this. And he has the, um, the intelligence and judgment and values and, and ethics, um, and energy, uh, to, to engage in, in something like this and help, uh, make an institution that I think we all believe in and care about, um, just to make sure it, it, it continues going in a, in a positive direction for the future. So that's, that's why, why I'm, why I'm here and why I wanted to take the time to, to, to do this and both to, you know, hear, ask you some, some questions and hear how you're thinking about stuff. Um, but, but also just to, uh, you know, give my kind of full endorsement that, you know, I think you're, um, I think it would be, it would be great. And I'm grateful personally that you're taking the time to go through this process and do this because I think it's going to be great for the university. Yeah, this is a labor of love and this is our your way and our way of expressing our deep love for the institution and uh, care for its future. Um, well, so Sam, why don't we, that's, <laughs> that's our impression of you, uh, you know. Thank you. Uh, and so, um, but why don't you uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, I grew up in Englewood, New Jersey. I was Harvard 05, so I was a little bit older, but I, you know, Mark, I got to meet Mark in Kirkland House uh, way back in the day, uh, which is a wild set of uh, a long time ago now. Uh, I, after, after Harvard, I was at Bain for a few years. I started a company. As Mark said, I got to work, uh, you know, with him on some incredibly awesome stuff at a crazy time uh, at, at Facebook Now Meta for, for, for many years. Um, and then I started a fund out West. And so now I'm a venture capitalist and I, I back other young entrepreneurs. I, I get to interact with one of the cool parts about my job is I get to interact with a lot of young um, people coming out of Harvard, uh, coming out of great schools and, and hear kind of their stories and help support what they're up to. So that's what I've been doing. Um, I'm married to a Harvard alum. I met my wife, Jessica, um, in college. We dated since and married. We now have three kids who are seven, five and two. Uh, and I live just south of San Francisco. Um, so I kind of have been a somewhat bi-coastal in my life. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think just to jump in for a second, I mean, to me, when I, we can get into a little bit of this, but it's clear that I think there are opportunities to help Harvard, um, kind of moving forward. And, you know, I think when I kind of saw what was going on this fall in particular, I've always cared a lot about Harvard and always tried to be very involved. You know, I really thought to myself, like, what else can I do to try to lean in? You know, I know a lot of friends you know, obviously not Mark and Scylla, but others who kind of have seen some of the challenges in higher ed and said, look, we're going to go work on other things. Like we're technologists, we're, you know, people who like to build new things, right? And so, the, the, you know, there's the impulse to say we can go build something else and build it better. But I think Harvard really matters as an institution and I really care about it. And so I think when, when kind of facing some of these challenges, you know, I thought to myself, well, what can I do that's more? And, you know, there are two boards that govern Harvard. Um, there's the corporation, which probably more people are familiar with. Um, it's kind of a pretty tightly held group. It's currently 12, well, it's supposed to be 13 people who kind of self-perpetuate um, in terms of who they choose as their successors. And then there's the overseers, which is this alumni organization, right? So it's kind of, you know, it's voted on by the alums, the alums select who's on it. And they're the kind of other board um, that together kind of lead Harvard. Um, so that's kind of the the opportunity is, you know, that I have, right? And that I was like, when I was thinking my, my doing a little bit of an end of year thinking about how to lean in and really be helpful. To me, it just seemed like an important thing to try to get on the board of overseers and see if I can make a difference. Um, I know people hopefully will be jumping on and off this call. I'm just gonna put um, the website to answer one of the questions of how do you um, nominate Sam for the board of overseers? He needs. 3,300 votes. Um, we don't think he's there yet because the Harvard has not confirmed. I feel like I'm on a telethon, but- yes, um, We're gonna keep going all night until- I'm gonna keep going, <laughs> but check out this website. It has a little bit more about Sam and it has instructions on how you can nominate him for the board of overseers. 
Thank you so much. Um, all right, Mark, what else should we, what should we talk about next? Well, I mean, I think maybe an open-ended question before jumping into any some of the specific issues, but I'm just curious what you've learned um, from this campaign so far. I mean, there are a lot of different issues to talk about. We'll get through a, a, a number of them, but what, what's kind of stood out from the conversations that you've had with, with uh, different alums? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I went into this, um, you know, not knowing what to expect and kind of just saying I was going to put my hat in the ring and obviously having support from a bunch of friends has been great. But I'll tell you the most surprising and kind of wonderful thing of doing this is I've had the opportunity through doing this to talk to so many people across the university. Um, you know, members of the corporation have reached out and I've spent time with them, you know, in person and, and, and on the phone, you know, several overseers, also a lot of faculty, a lot of professors, um, administrators, et cetera, have all kind of reached out and wanted to engage in kind of some of the platform points I've put forward and talk about it. And to be honest, it's been an extremely positive experience. Like what's been clear to me is that there's a lot of people that not only deeply care about Harvard, but broadly agree with a lot of the things that, you know, I've been talking about and focused on, whether we're talking about really refocusing on like the Veritas mission and the academic mission of the school, some of the free speech issues we can get into, things like that. So I think there really is like quite a lot of support across the organization, I think, for some of the changes in, in that I think could be effective, um, you know, and some of the government's evolutions you could think about. Um, so it's been really positive from that perspective. I think the pessimistic part, right, if the optimism is like there's clearly this very large, silent-ish majority of people that believe these things, right, the pessimistic part is that, you know, it is a large, complicated institution. Um, there's a lot of administrators, there's a lot of schools, there's a lot of components to it. And I mean, we've seen this before, you know, I've had the privilege of being involved in a lot of technology companies that went from very small to very big, very quickly. And what you see is that, you know, some of the, the thing the, the realities of operating a large platform are very, very different than when you kind of have a small school. So Harvard has been on a 400 year journey there instead of a five or 10 year journey there, which is kind of what I've seen in Silicon Valley at warp speed, right, over and over again in different things. But it does feel like the, the, the challenge is that just with 400 years becoming a truly global, important platform that's very complicated and has lots of different components to it. You can say, I believe in these principles or we need to move in this direction. The challenge is actually making it happen, right? Um, and figuring out, you know, administratively, what, where do you have to go? How do you have to think about policies? And kind of, oh, there's been a lot of like, let's put it this way, there's a lot of complexity in red tape that comes up, you know, starting with things like the fact that you need, you know, three times as many signatures uh, with a Harvard key to get on the nomination for an overseer as you do to, uh, to get in a congressional race <laughs> in the United States, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so maybe we should just jump right into some of the uh, some of the audience questions because they're coming in. Um, yeah. So I I'm, I'm just going to read some of the questions that are coming in. Um, so Mark, this I, I have it pulled up here. Why don't I read it? It's um, it's okay, an audience. Go for it. Yeah, it's an audience question. Um, I'm sort of summarizing a couple um, because this one has come up as a theme is, um, you know, this individual is concerned about free speech and anti-Semitism at Harvard. And how much control does the board of overseers has to help it just address the direction this university, that Harvard University is going in? Yeah, I think this is a great question. So when I started this campaign, a lot of people I know said to me, Sam, it's really great that you wanna lean in, but you do realize the overseers have no power. Like this is a ceremonial board, you know, it's kind of a board that, you know, people have been very invested in Harvard get on and they do some academic review. You know, the, the more I've dug in, you actually realize the overseers actually do have quite a bit of power, um, even if they haven't been recently using it. We can get into the governance implications of that and how to evolve it. But when you think about the formal powers of the overseers, um, you know, they do, they're on the presidential search committee and have a veto on presidents, right? They have a veto on corporation appointments. They have a veto on a lot of really senior important things. Now, it's true that they haven't used it very much recently, but the reality is when you have those types of rights, when you're on the presidential search committee, when you're thinking, you have the ability to ask questions and you have the ability to kind of point research and shine light in a bunch of different directions. So I think we'll talk about kind of from the anti-Semitism perspective and free speech, these are things I deeply care about. I think they're also related. Um, and I do think that you think about the kind of hierarchy of 
helping with governance problems and fixing some governance issues, you know, fixing some things around mission focus and mission drift on effectively starting with academics first and thinking of all the inputs to that, including free speech, right? Academic free speech is a key input to, uh, you know, academic excellence as a core. And then candidly, I think of a lot of what we've seen with anti-Semitism on campus from my personal perspective is much more of a canary in the coal mine versus like the fundamental problem. So I do think it needs to be addressed, but I think that the way you address it has to be not just by trying to band-aid it or specifically, but actually dealing with kind of more of these structural problems. I do think the overseers have a real stake in this and a real say, especially if they assert kind of historically, you know, the actual formal role they have which I do think there's appetite for them to do. Um, I, I think it's a little bit of a change from what's been done recently, but I think it's in everyone's interest for the overseers to step up a little bit in that way. Um, candidly, I think it's even in the corporation's interest, which we can get into. Um, and I think from that perspective, you know, as an overseer, even if I'm just one of 30 voices to start, uh, I think you really can unlock a lot and help with those types of issues. So, it's complicated, but I think it's but I think the, the short answer is I think you can have a real say and you can really help. Yeah. So in terms of the process, there's a question here from um, pardon me if I if I uh, mispronounce the name Michelle Barmazel of uh, Sam, you've been in contact with uh, have you been in contact with any current board of overseers members? And if so, what are the takeaways? I have um, actually several have reached out and I've talked to many of them. And as I kind of said, it's it's actually been. Um, it's made me more optimistic uh, in a lot of ways, because I think the reality is of the Board of Overseers members I've talked to, and they've all asked to be anonymous when I reference them <laughs> uh, for understandable reasons it's, it, uh, to some point, but there's been a lot of agreement that there needs to be change, that the overseers need to step up, that some of the things we've been talking about in terms of mission drift and refocusing on academic excellence as like the core Veritas value of Harvard, they're supportive. Now, I think the thing is, um, that in terms of getting there, um, you do need sometimes some people who are willing to come a little bit from the outside and be insiders um, and push a little bit more publicly on some of these things. I think the reality is for a lot of organizational reasons, sometimes people, even people who are very successful and powerful and overseers and all that stuff, they are sometimes afraid to kind of speak up in public. And, and I do think you need people who are willing to do that, which I am. So in talking to overseers, I mean, the takeaways have been it's complicated. There's a lot of facets to it and there's a lot of administrative um, changes and, and small kind of details of governance that need to be adjusted in order to unlock things. But the general takeaway I've had is a lot of positivity that it's not like, you know, a lot of these values um, and the things I'm expressing and trying to run on are antithetical to the entire direction of the board. There's actually quite a few people on the board who are very aligned with them. All right. Um, well, another question that that came in separately is from a grad student um, who is who asked what role you think that students can play um, in in some of the issues that you're talking about in terms of fostering unity and a good environment on campus. Yeah. So to me, the interesting place from talking to a lot of young alums, I was actually at a it was a wild experience for, for me as a 40 year old now at a young alum event this week in San Francisco, so talking to a lot of people there and talking to a lot of others. You know, there seems like this evolved since our era, this, this kind of weird split on campus, where I would argue when I was at Harvard, um, the culture of free speech in the classroom was extreme, right? People really felt safe to explore any idea, right, to speak up in class and, and and it wasn't, it was all in the pursuit of truth and academic and like learning, right? In like a very civil way. And I, I thought that was a great culture. I've actually talked to other Harvard alums through this process. You know, one notably yesterday was Harry Hartz, who's a federal judge. We were talking the same thing in the 70s. He was saying, you know, there was this culture, it was one of the most magical things to have freedom to explore ideas in class uh, in an academic setting. And so it does seem talking to a lot of young alums that they are scared to speak up in class, right? That they don't feel like all ideas are welcome um, and that they don't have that same dynamic in class. While on the outside, you know, when you go into Harvard Yard and in the freshman, you know, the, near the freshman dorms or places like that, you know, what you're seeing is a lot of speech that might not be targeted so much towards actually promoting academics and learning, right? As much as trying to silence other voices. And I think, so there's been this weird thing where there's like, a lot of speech outside of the classroom and maybe not enough inside the classroom. 
I think the best thing you can do as a student, um, you know, is if you believe in these principles is one, try to speak up in class, right? Like mirror the behavior, like don't be afraid, even when there might be consequences to kind of express different viewpoints, like be fearless from that perspective, because it'll encourage others to do the same, right? And so I think the more that students can do that in class, the better. And then outside of class, I mean, I think the thing I would think twice about from for any student I'd ask them to think about is, Harvard is an academic institution and its goal is to create, again, the best scholarship and have the best environment for students to learn, right? And so if your speech is in service of that, that's great. If your speech is not in service of that or, you know, or is, is basically creating disruptions to that, that's, I think, a thing that all the parties of the university need to think about from administrators to corporation members to students as well, right? In terms of what types of speech, you know, to promote versus not um, with their actions. So that's how I would think about it. But I do think the biggest thing as a student is, you know, the speech culture is informed by a lot of things. It's not solely the responsibility of students, but students being brave and speaking up, I think is, you will set an example and you can kind of drive the culture that way as well. One of the questions that that was submitted, I think speaks to Harvard's um, unique role as an institution. The, the question from you know, Varun Bhartia is how many of the problems that you see at Harvard do you think are specific to Harvard versus across higher education across the U.S. And I, mean, I guess the 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 addendum that I'd add to that is like to what extent do you think getting these right at Harvard can play a broader role in in helping to shape um, either education or, or or society? Yeah, I mean, my take on this, and this is part of the reason I'm so passionate about it, is I am a proud Harvard alum, but I really think Harvard sets the tone for a lot of higher ed. And it's just, it's the best known education brand in the world, right? And because it's the best known education brand in the world, there's a few things that come of that. One is people fight over it, right? The stakes feel higher because people think that by influencing Harvard, right? In various ways, in, you know, for various causes that they influence a lot of other people they are setting a tone at higher ed. So there's a lot more pressure at Harvard. It's harder at Harvard than almost anywhere else as a result, right? Because everyone recognizes that. And I think that creates extra challenges. But I do think on the flip side that, you know, those people who kind of try to influence Harvard or, or kind of recognize that they're not wrong, right? Which is, it's such a big brand, it does set a tone. And so if you can solve them at Harvard, if you can solve the problems or work on the problems at Harvard or get, you know, move towards a place where, again, Harvard can, again, as it has been for 400 years, put scholarship first, foremost, and only, right? That is the goal, right? And think about how free speech and diversity, and everything's an input to that goal. Um, I do think it sets the tone and really does matter for a lot of other um, higher ed institutions. And I'd even go a step further, which is, look, one thing I think a lot about from like a technology and society perspective is, you know, we're entering a really wild new world in a lot of ways, right? Like, you know, and as the world gets wilder broadly and, you know, people, you know, choose their truths and things like that in all sorts of new and, and challenging ways, um, the reality is that having trusted institutions is becoming more important, not less important, right? And as a result, it's not, I just think the stakes are incredibly high for not higher, not just for Harvard as kind of a representation of higher ed, but for Harvard as a 400 year old trusted brand, right? Of truth, it's literally in the slogan of the school, right? That regardless of politics and regardless of kind of, you know, how crazy the world gets in different directions, a broad set of Americans and hopefully the world can go back to and say, Harvard, what's coming out of Harvard is trustable and does matter. Um, and we can trust regardless of kind of whatever our local realities look like. Um, so I think that's like, it, I think it is very important from that perspective. So I'm going to remind everyone again, this is um, this is us trying to shine a light on Sam Lesson's um, uh, attempt to get on the ballot for the uh, for the overseers at Harvard. If you go to the website, samforoverseer.com, it has both. Uh, a, you can learn a little bit more about Sam and it has instructions on how to um, how to get, use your Harvard key account to nominate Sam. Uh, after which, if he gets nominated, you can decide whether or not you want to vote for him in the um, election. I will say it is not easy. Someone in the comments uh, just noted it does take 24 hours for your Harvard Key account once you get it to be active. So yes, it, I, I, this is a like not a small feat. Um, so yeah, I yeah. like deeply appreciate anyone going through the process to do this. Totally. I will tell you, it's been a, it's that that has been funny as a as a technologist at heart. Uh, I will admit that the twenty four hour waiting period 
uh, before you can vote is, is somewhat is somewhat uh, uh, funny. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so one question that I'd love to get to is um, there's, there's obviously a lot of questions about views on Harvard's opportunities and challenges. But, you know, as a person who is running to be involved in this, there, there are a few questions to the effect of, you know, are you going to have the time availability to be active on the board of overseers while still being a full-time venture capitalist? And how do you think about the kind of the energy that you plan to bring to this or the, the time commitment or how you plan to engage? I think it might be useful to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, look, the 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 nice part about being an early stage venture capitalist is I do have a lot of control of my schedule. Um, and I think from that perspective, you know, Mark and Silla know that for many years, you know, I've been thinking a lot about like, what are ways that I can really make a difference? You know, one of the things I've seen in my career uh, and life is I've had these incredible moments where I've been involved in things that really made a difference um and it's a great thing it's like sometimes you say you only get one or two of those in your life i think you know the time i got to spend with mark was a time where i was like this matters like i'm working on something that has global implications and it's it's really it's important i'm not doing it just as a job i'm doing it because i care um and i care about the outcomes and i think the good news is i've had that moment a handful of times in my career in my life and i love being an early stage venture capitalist you know, for the LPs who are on the Zoom, I'm not going anywhere. And like, you know, I think we're doing very well as a firm. Um, but I do think it, that mission really matters. And when I see these opportunities, like with Harvard, it, this is kind of those types of opportunities you have to step up for and be willing to put the hard work into um, because they're the ones that matter and they're the ones that you remember and they're the ones that you're proud of, right? So the upshot is, is yes, it is a lot of work. I'm gonna have to fly to Boston six times a year. I generally go to Boston once a year, right? Um, and there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of, you know, hard work involved, but honestly, I think, you know, when you have the ability to organize your schedule to take on serious challenges like this, cause it is, you know, a serious challenge, um, you know, what else are you doing with your time? Like these are the important moments to activate for. Yeah. Maybe one that that I saw in the in the questions that um that that is actually directed to to me and Priscilla is what, what's driving your support of Sam's candidacy, you know, other than your friendship with Sam and knowledge of his his personal qualities and and it's and there's there's a, a, an addendum of what do you think has gone wrong at Harvard for for me this isn't about anything that's gone wrong it's just that you know Priscilla and I are very invested in Harvard we think it's important um for the world for for the reasons that I, I i laid out up front and um we just believe that harvard has the capacity to change the world in, in incredibly positive ways we've invested a lot of our own time um and and capital in in uh helping to uh, helping harvard spin up different programs like um like this ai program to to become a leader in, in in that part of engineering and a bunch of other work around life sciences um and as part of this, you know, we just we spend some time thinking about who are the the people who can help steward and and shape the university to be positive in the in in the future. And I mean, that's a lot of what you know I spend my time is uh, on is is you know judging which people will be best to lead or be involved in different projects. And from just having known Sam for a while and worked with him in in different capacities and. Um, and seen seen his work, you know, at both at Meta and before when he was an entrepreneur starting companies, and now um, as an investor um, helping uh, foster a bunch of companies to to be to be more successful um, and engage in a, in a number of other issues outside of that. I just Sam is the type of person who I would want uh, to to be involved in governing Harvard, and I'd feel a lot more confident in the future of the institution if. Um, Sam or or more people like him were involved in this, and that's why that's why I want to take the time to um, to encourage all of you to um, go through the the um, you know, somewhat time consuming process of setting up a Harvard Key account. Not and too do bad. Not too bad. Don't be too scared. <laughs> all right, all right. It's uh, sure. If you, you have, have to wait twenty four hours you. after you do it, yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that's that's a good point. But no, I, I I think you know for all the reasons that we're talking about, it's like the the the. How well Harvard does, I think, has a direct impact on, um, you know, how much great research is created, and 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 um, I think it has a unique ability to shape the whole field of higher education, which is obviously important to um, to training whole generations of people. So, um, and I think we'll be better off, and Harvard will be better off if someone, if if, if Sam or, or more people like that are are, are involved. 
Um, well, with that, Sam, um, I want to give you the chance to close us out. Um, yep. And anything you want to add or make sure people know about you. No, again, Marcus, thank you for joining everyone who's, you know, voted or is on the Zoom or is willing to share kind of the message. I, I really appreciate all the work, you know, that other people have put in. And again, it's been really, this has been a whirlwind experience to drive, um, but it's been great. I mean, working with a bunch of people who have stepped up and said, not only do, you know, we believe in kind of what you're doing, but we're willing to go out and not just vote, but like help you get votes from our class or spread the word of kind of the message of what you're doing or help people kind of through the process of voting. Um, it's been really, really wonderful from that perspective. You know, I, I, um, I really think this matters. I wouldn't be doing it if I, if I didn't. Um, and I do think, again, that I, I really have found this process to be more optimistic than I expected, that despite the challenges, which we all know, right, in various forms that Harvard has faced recently, um, and some of the higher, the problems that all of higher ed has now, the bones are great, right? To Mark's point, you know, there is incredible, there's an incredible wealth of history and talent um, and real, you know, opportunity to do great things. So, you know, rather than, you know, giving up on Harvard, which, you know, again, I'm, I'm very far from, and I know Mark and Silar and many others, you know, I do think that this is a great moment to push a little bit and I'm willing to do the work. So, you know, again, to the extent that you guys are willing to go, I don't want to scare people off. If you have a Harvard key, it's extremely easy to vote. If you don't have a Harvard key, you have to do a little bit and then wait 24 hours, but, but please, you know, look into the process, um, you know, go to samforoverseers.com. Um, and I'd also say spread the word because the reality is, is as much as there's a lot of intellectually interesting questions to ask about a lot of this stuff, ultimately this happens or not on a vet, get out the vote campaign, right? So every time, you know, emailing your college roommates or texting them um, and asking for support as well, it really does make all the difference. So thank you. And, and do you have, you have some sense or estimate of how close you are? I mean, obviously you don't, you haven't so gotten notified yet. We don't know in details, but like, we but... have... We have like, so we have until the the 31st. So we're kind of right up against the end of the deadline here, right? And, you know, I think my sense is, is that we, you know, if you need 3,300, we clearly still need at least a thousand, if not more, right? Um, so we're making progress, but we still have some distance to cover. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at. All right, uh, yeah. well, thank you. thank you everyone. It was nice um, sharing. 30 minutes of this Friday afternoon evening with everyone um, and to get to highlight our friend Sam's passion um, and care. Um, and uh, Sam, good luck. We'll be counting. We'll be at, uh, January Thanks, 31st is the deadline. Thanks, guys. And Mark, I'm going to put in an appeal for you on that honorary degree. I feel like that should count. I feel like you, you need a Harvard that. key account. Mark, let's <laughs> we'll email. We'll email IT support and see if they can. Do it. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Have guys. a good weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.